In this lecture, I'll be introducing you to a unique sounding stringed instrument, often associated with Afghanistan, but perhaps a little paradoxically, the music I'll use to introduce you to that instrument actually comes from India. After you've watched this lecture, I'll direct you to a performance on that instrument by a young Pashtun musician from Afghanistan, so we'll have come full circle by the time you've watched that. The instrument in question is the rubab, also spelled rabab and robab, probably owing to regional nuances of pronunciation and the usual uncertainties regarding transliteration from a language that uses one alphabet to a language that uses another. If you're interested in this instrument and wish to pursue it further, you'll want to search under all three spellings. The rubab is quite unlike any other stringed instrument on earth, and even though it shares a name with the rababa in Egypt and the rebab in Indonesia, it's nothing like those other instruments. In fact, the name actually means bowed stringed instrument, and that's an accurate description of the instruments in Egypt and Indonesia, which are incidentally quite a bit alike but not at all a description of this one from Afghanistan, which is plucked. Most string instruments familiar in the West are lightweight resonant wooden boxes, usually made of thin plywood. That's an accurate description of every member of the violin family, of the guitar, lute, balalaika, ukulele, and so on. This instrument, on the other hand, is carved from a single block of wood, usually mulberry or walnut, both of which are quite dense and massive. The region that is played is a scooped out hollow over which a skin of animal hide is stretched tightly like a drum head. The bridge of the instrument sits on this head and it is that unique construction that lends the rubab a sound like that of no other instrument on earth. The wooden body of the instrument, unlike that of a violin or guitar, has no natural resonance whatsoever, but the open chamber underneath the right hand serves as a kind of built-in amplifier. And the instrument's many resonance strings, different numbers depending on the particular instrument, which comes in three basic sizes, add a little extra garnish to the rhubarb's distinctive sound. In performance, the rubab is most often paired with the tabla, as you see in this image, and as you will hear in both the music in this lecture and in the follow-up video that I'll ask you to watch when you're done with this one. To introduce you to this instrument, I'm going to treat you to a performance of Gar Aya Mera Pardesi, My Wanderer Has Returned Home. Although it is played here by a notable Afghan musician, Humayun Saki, the song is actually in Hindi and was written for a film. But the language doesn't matter here, as we'll hear it played, not sung, with the song worked up into a formally fascinating performance that features both expert playing and compositional elegance. The composition is set in the darkest of the minor modes, Phrygian, on F sharp. I'll give you a preview in the form of an outline. The work is in three large parts, with the second part, the main body, being by far the longest. There is a two-part introduction, with the first part just a little foretaste of the falling cadential pattern that you'll hear again and again, moving in free rhythm. The second part of the introduction is considerably longer, with the pulse now established with the addition of the tabla and other percussive effects. As you can see from this outline, this section is organized in three paragraphs. If that introduction reminded you of the improvised raga exposition that occupied the first eight minutes of Sarasiruha, good for you. The basic idea is the same, although here the procedure is compressed, occupying less than a quarter of the time spent by the Alapana plus Tanam in Sarasiruha. The main body of the work behaves in broad outline somewhat like sonata form in the classical music of the West, but it's just an outline, and I mention sonata form only as a basis of comparison in case some of you are familiar with it. 
The first part, a double exposition of three themes, is as long as parts two and three, the development and recapitulation, together. The exposition is organized in two cycles of cycles, hence hypercycles, and during these cycles, the three themes, one, two, and three, are set forth. The themes are fairly similar in their sound, so you'll need to listen carefully in order to differentiate them. Try to watch my commentary with understanding, and think of it as progressive division into smaller and smaller units. Read from top to bottom. The most immediate information will scroll along the bottom, with cumulative units doing the same, and so on. It shouldn't be hard to do that. Be sure to match my descriptions with what you hear. They're the same thing. The brief development section begins with a sort of fanfare and continues with the varied treatment of a falling cadential pattern or motive heard during all three of the themes. And when that development has run its course, the recapitulation consists only of a single cycle, cycle B, with its constituent themes brought back in reverse order. The coda is set in a different meter and tempo than everything that preceded it. You can count the meter as either 6, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 1, 2, or 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, or both. You're going to encounter this rhythmic profile, a kind of polemetry, when we examine some music from Latin America, so you might want to keep it in mind. The musical ideas in the coda are all summary sounding, and the piece ends with a magnificent melodic tumble to the low tonic, which is greeted forthwith by well-deserved applause. Enjoy the music and do try to internalize the way the whole is organized. That aspect of it should be fairly easy to do, since the whole piece is only a little over eight minutes long. The playing really is masterful.
Now I want to say just a few words about the Pashtuns, a sizable ethnic minority in Afghanistan and Pakistan for whom the rubab is the principal musical instrument, an instrument deeply wrapped up in their musical identity. Until the last couple of generations, a majority of the Pashtuns were nomadic pastoralists, that is, they tended herds of goats or cattle, flocks of sheep, and so forth. Most of their time was spent out on the mountainsides, driving their herds from pasturage to pasturage with the change of seasons, and visiting cities only rarely. And quite a few of them, in order to occupy their spare time, of which you would have quite a lot following that way of life, learned to play the rubab. If you have a lot of time to devote to that, you're apt to get really good at it. And that's why there's such a distinctive school of rubab playing associated with the Pashtuns. I want you to watch a video clip of a young Pashtun musician named Ishar. I haven't been able to find out much about him, but what little I have found suggests that his family was so occupied by that way of life until recently, and that he's well acquainted with it and identifies with it. In this clip, Ishar and a tabla playing friend are out on a mountainside, entertaining some other friends with some music. I have to tell you, every time I watch this, I remember all over again why it is that I fell in love with music in the first place, all those decades ago. You'll find a link in the description below.